There are a lot of non-fiction books out there. And as a result, there are also a lot of overrated non-fiction books. So in this video, I'm going to talk about overrated non-fiction books and their underrated counterparts. The first overrated book is Peter Thiel's Zero to One. Notes on startups or maybe on how to build the future. I didn't get why he didn't commit. Uh, it says both on here with a comma, so I think it's like, maybe it's one of the two. Uh, the book has a lot of weird writing on it. Uh, it's for example, what valuable company is nobody building? I think there's one in blood diagnostics, a lot of potential for innovation there. Um, yeah, so that already screamed to me that the book is overrated, but the actual contents of the book itself are also good reasons why it's overrated. So I'll start off with saying that the book offers useful metaphors and like concepts that maybe you could find use for. But that's about the extent of the book because right after that, you quickly realize the book isn't backed by any evidence. It's mostly just theories and like distinctions that could be useful, maybe not. There's no substantiation of the claims. You have to take the claims as true. Uh, and I would argue that like we basically accept this book or the reason why this book is popular is because of who the author is, not because the book is actually good. <laughs> Got it. For example, he focuses on theoretical distinctions when it comes to Apple, almost to a detriment. He talks about how design of a product is not the only thing that determines the success of a product, but also the design of a company. And then he shows like the NASDAQ uh, performance of Apple. But there's more going on in Apple. Like the designs of Apple, the company, also were responsible for the downfalls in the NASDAQ. And, he completely ignores the fact that Steve Jobs almost bankrupt the company. I don't know why people fetishize Apple so much, but uh, he goes over that stuff and he gives like really weak arguments for it that aren't really substantiated. Uh, overall, like the book is again, like useful armchair analysis, but don't take it too seriously because the, there's not gonna be any evidence to support the claims made inside the book. So that's why it's overrated. <laughs> Underrated alternative to zero to one would be virtual competition. Uh, this book will go over modern markets as they relate to like e-commerce uh, and it will tell you how they work, where they're going, and what we should think about uh, ethically about these markets. They'll talk about things like consumer profiling in the digital age, uh, marketplaces being ran by algorithms. So like rather than going into say a e-commerce space where you can look at all the products. Uh, then instead what you'll have is a marketplace will feed your products based off of its consumer profile of you, right? It, it even talks about price discrimination based off of predictive algorithms. It goes over all of this stuff and that's stuff you need to know basically if you're going to be in the e-commerce space. Some other great gems that are not popular are Michael E. Porter's books. These books are terrific. Uh, competitive Advantage and Competitive Strategy. Uh, also Competitive Advantages of Nations, but you could just focus on Competitive Advantage and Competitive Strategy. These books are great because they're actually business analysis books that give data and give real-time examples of companies. Uh, competitive Advantage will talk about the different advantages you can get uh, whether it's through supply chain, whether it's through uh, technology, uh, relationships with firms, uh, consumer, uh, consumer portfolios, stuff like this. Right? There are different advantages you can get from that stuff. The competitive strategy book will talk about strategies you can use to get advantages. So for example, uh, let's say you want to expand your business or collapse your business, whether you want to enter a market or exit a market, uh, whether you want to focus on certain types of business relationships, and which strategies can use to acquire those relationships. Those two books will talk about these things and give real-time examples. Well, the frickin' die! Uh, I believe they give this one example with Kodak where he talks about the competitive strategy they used for uh, technological innovation and then gives the competitive advantages they get from a supply chain value by having lower manufacturing costs or lower printing costs and how that gives them a competitive advantage in their supply chain. So again, if you want actual good books for analyzing businesses and how to start businesses, Virtual Competition and Michael E. Porter's books. The Subtle Art of, I'm gonna say not caring because we're family friendly here. Uh, the Subtle Art of Not Caring is actually not a bad book per se, but it doesn't live up to the hype that it gets. 
I agree that we shouldn't um, engage in like the relentless positivity of the self-help industry. That stuff is probably not good for you. And that I actually agree with Mark Manson on. Nice. But then when it comes to replacing the, the relentless positivity with things like kindness, so on and so forth, I think that actually misses some important lessons that you get in books like Frederick Nietzsche's it's either Genealogy of Morals or Beyond Good and Evil. I read these books like when I was 15, so I don't remember which book it was in. But basically in these two books, one of these books, Nietzsche explains what it, some people confuse as I should call every, every other person in the world a sheep who just follows herd morality. He explains this concept, and by the way, it's a complete misinterpretation, uh, I would argue. He explains what's called like the master-slave morality dynamic, and what you should take from this is either one, uh, choose values for your own reasons, or two, just ignore values, which doesn't mean be a bad person, but you could ignore values. So what is this actual distinction? He basically says rich people will say it's really great to work hard for what you have, uh, or what you have, yeah, work hard for what you have, and they have a lot of stuff, so therefore they must work really hard. It's almost like a value that they're supporting that makes them look good, and makes their counterparts, their slaves, the poor people, look bad. And the poor people will be like, well, it's really great to be humble. You should be humble, right? Be kind and be humble. Well, that makes them look good because they don't have anything to brag about, right? They're poor. And it makes their masters, the rich people, look bad. And Nietzsche's saying we should just bypass all of this, I would argue, this is what he's saying, and choose values for our own reasons, or you can just completely do away with them and do whatever you want. Which doesn't mean, again, be a bad person. You can definitely be a good person without worrying about choosing values. So I think Settle Out of Not Caring misses this point by suggesting things like be kind. For that reason, I would suggest the, I guess not super underrated, but still underrated compared to Mark Manson's book, uh, Nietzsche's Genealogy of Morals or Beyond Good and Evil. Another overrated book is The 48 Laws of Human Nature. The reason why it's overrated is because what the book actually offers doesn't live up to the hype that is there. The book is not scientific and a lot of the laws are pretty much useless when it comes to actual human behavior. For example, the first law inside the book basically argues that you shouldn't let emotion cloud reason. Well, Neuropsychology has since found that that is complete and total nonsense because emotion and reason are virtually the same thing. In fact, it might not even make sense to make the distinction. When people have received damage to the emotional centers in their brain, they can no longer reason properly. When people receive damage to the reasoning centers in their brain, well, they also have issues with emotion. These two things are actually pretty much the same. And neuropsychologists like Antonio Damasio have spent their whole career arguing against stuff like this. So the book is like basically armchair psychology. Now I'm not saying you can't get any use from it, right? These distinctions like be calm and use reason and so on and so forth. Useful heuristics, again, maybe you can get some utility from them. They're just interesting to explore perhaps, but they're not really scientific. And for that reason, I don't think the book should be getting as much hype. It's a bit overrated. Now let's say you're somebody who bought the 48 laws of human nature because you actually want to understand human nature which is actually like a small minority of people because most of the people who are talking about this book they all want to be like poker bros they all want to be like the people who are aviators they're all powerful people you know not talking a lot just very relaxed and in control and dominant <laughs> But if you're not one of the poker bros and you actually want to understand human nature, right, because a lot of the times you get told we're either blank slates, like we're pieces of paper, or on the other hand we're like primates, right, like the political left says we're pieces of paper, the political right says we're primates, some people say we're brains trapped inside jars. If you want to get good books on human nature, then I would recommend The Adapted Mind or Steven Pinker's The Blake Sleep. These two books, The Adapted Mind, Evolutionary Psychology and the Generation of Culture, and Blank Slate, The Modern Denial of Human Nature. So the adapted mind is going to teach you about uh, what is an instinct, what constitutes human nature, and what is the relationship between human nature and culture. A lot of people don't really understand this stuff. It will also explain the difference between, let's say, evolutionary psychology and armchair psychology, uh, adaptationism, and fitness maximization, what's sometimes called like uh, ordinary evolutionary biology, where they use physiological approaches versus like sociobiology, where they look at behaviors and how they ma maximize fitness. Uh, the adaptive mind will also help you understand how to critically anal analyze 
how so stories or basically a lot of the explanations as to why something is an instinct or why it's an adaptation unfortunately a lot of these stories are kind of just it happens to be the case I think they're called yeah they're called just just so stories that's what they're actually called and it's important to be able to understand that you need to critically analyze these stories so that this book will basically teach you that stuff and that's what it's good for the other book is Stephen Pinker's The Blank Slate now this book will be a good book on human nature because it's going to go and explain to you why human nature exists it will show you some of the studies that support the existence of human nature and will also tackle a lot of the bad ideas about human nature that philosophers have been spewing for many many years so those two books are really good books if you want to understand human nature and the blank slate is a little bit more popular but the adaptive mind is definitely not a popular book at all so homo sapiens is probably my favorite fan fiction book about humankind huh? Uh, the book tries to start off from the very uh, original humans going back to basically when humans were just naked walking around in forests like doing human things uh, and then it goes on to all the way up to like modern capitalism it's fine if you want to do this for a world history book I actually don't think the project is overly ambitious but there's a lot of gaps in his book that he then fills in with his own speculations he basically presents contentious theories that aren't really accepted as factual uh, he undersites when he really needs to have citations and the sources that he then does cite are even questionable to begin with and on top of that if you ask experts what they think about this book most archaeologists have said about this book is that his narrative doesn't actually correspond to what archaeological evidence has to say about this stuff and so the book is extremely overrated because it's basically like Deepak Chopra wrote an archaeological book and now everyone's reading it like it's fact which it's not. Now a much better alternative to this book is the Penguin History of the World. This book also starts off at the beginning of human history. I should also say it's got a lot more in the book which seems reasonable given the scope of the project but this book also starts off at the beginning of human history, leads up to ancient civilizations and then it connects ancient civilizations like Mesopotamia, ancient China, so on and so forth to more recent empires like Russian Empire, Roman Empire, Ottoman Empire then from the empires you get to the modern times it also goes over the different movements that have proliferated through this time so it's whether it's like abolition of slavery, uh, revolutionaries, uh, colonialism, racism, things like this it goes over all these different ideas and isms that have basically played out through time and connects them to the actual conditions of society so this is a really really good book it's a very systematic book and it will take you like 90 to 100 hours to read but it is much better than the fan fiction that was written and got really popular the next overrated book is lifespan by david sinclair this book basically should be read as why we age and why we don't have to an autobiographical account of how big brain dr sinclair is <laughs> he really talks about how much he loves math and science especially as a little bit little boy too much in this book this book look i like it but it's got some problems what I like about it is it exposes people to the longevity community or the anti-aging community and it gets people into this stuff, right? It talks about these issues because these issues have been ignored for a very long time and when you talk about them, basically people say, well, like, well, if we make people immortal, then, like, we're going to have immortal Hitler. I mean, there's more to it than that, right? And he goes over some of the science in this book. He actually talks about some of the stuff like caloric restriction, uh, low-protein diets, uh, metformin, uh, different molecules we're exploring for anti-aging purposes even some of the approaches like the engineering approach uh, that we can take towards anti-aging where the book falls short is it's a lot about him like it's really like an autobiography and it actually doesn't go into the science quite enough so for that reason I think there are some better books than this one uh, the first book is The Abolition of Aging by uh, David Wood this guy is a futurist uh, he's a very learned man I've spoken with him a few times and I can definitely tell you he knows a lot about a lot of fields. Very smart guy. This book is like a general anti-aging approach. It talks about like the different research labs, uh, the different theories, the different ways we're going about solving aging, uh, the political issues with aging, the funding issues with aging, uh, how society currently views aging. It's just an all-encompassing approach to aging, which is a really, really good uh, book to get into aging. The next one is Aubrey de Grey's... Uh, now, yeah, Aubrey de Grey and Michael Ray, these two wrote a book together, and this book is more about a specific approach to aging, and he's considered like the grandfather, kind of, of this uh, movement, and basically, this book will talk about 
taking an engineering approach to aging and he looks at all the areas where we can identify aging and what we can do to fix it. So if you talk about like the telomeres, shortening of the telomeres, if you're talking about oxidative stress, uh, if we're talking about um, mutations causing noise inside the system, uh, what are some engineering approaches we can take to these issues? Not that this book is really good for it. I would say that this book, however, is a bit more heavy in biology. It's meant to be a general audience book. Aubrey Duguay cannot write for a general audience, even though he tried. And as a result, you need a little bit of a biology background to even begin this book, but I would still recommend reading this book and putting in the effort to actually understand this book because it is a foundational text for the field. The next book uh, on here is another Robert Greene book, and it's The 48 Laws of Power, How to Quickly Make Everybody Dislike You and Not Empathize with Anybody. No, I'm joking. Okay, that's obviously not what he's trying to do here. But this book suffers from the same problems that the other books suffer for and actually more. So this book will tell you, basically the grand scope of this book is to go over all the like authors like Sun Tzu or Machiavelli, look at different strategy books and so on and so forth and synthesize them into laws. The problem however is one, again, not scientific and two, it actually ruins the original text because the original texts were usually written for specific conditions, like for example, the prince. In the prince, a lot of the stuff that was written there was related to specific conditions. Just take the idea that a prince who takes too much help can look like a weak prince, or like a prince who doesn't have money to fund an army can look like a weak prince. And so you might come up with this principle saying don't take too much help, but that's meant for princes. Uh, you're not a prince who's being watched by millions of people, and so that's not an issue. On top of that, you don't really need money to raise an army. And if we go even further, what modern social psychology teaches us is that accepting help makes people like you more. So if you allow someone to help you in a small way or in a small task, they will like you more after that, which is counterintuitive to what you would learn in something like The Prince. On top of that, that also promotes further cooperation between you and that person which is way better because cooperation tends to outcompete uh, individual selfish behavior amongst modern humans. And so you want to cooperate with people. So this book is overrated because it is just unscientific in a lot of ways and kind of ruins the original sources. If you want to explore stuff like this though, because again, it's just fun, it's entertaining, useful heuristics, I get all that. I'd recommend actually reading the original sources. So like the Discourses on Livy or Machiavelli's The Prince. Uh, those books are much better books in my opinion and probably even uh, more enjoyable to read as a result of that. So I would read those underrated books and not read the overrated 48 Laws of Power. So those are overrated books and their underrated counterparts. Uh, let me know what you guys think in the comments section because I've had this conversation with people before and people tell me that Robert Greene's books aren't overrated. People tell me that Sapiens is a great text. I disagree a hundred percent on those takes but i'm always open for discussion so let me know what you guys think and with that being said go to shooters